Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri is one of my favorite films of the last few years, and I credit a large part of my enjoyment of this film to this not-so-subtle literary illusion at the beginning. This clear reference to 20th century American author Flannery O'Connor clues us into her influence on writer and director Martin McDonough. I find that intimations of O'Connor's unique approach to art and stories permeate this film, and I think that understanding her influence can help us to more deeply understand its characters and its themes. Flannery O'Connor is famously associated with a southern gothic genre, which is a difficult quality to pinpoint in and of itself. It's a style often associated with stark realism, violence, and dark humor, but it is also concerned with the supernatural and the sublime. The opening of the film immediately presents Ebbing as somewhat otherworldly. The contrast between the operatic singing and the lush landscape with the dilapidated billboards capture well the paradoxical nature of southern gothic stories. We might even say that the town is ebbing between the physical and the spiritual realm. To say that Flannery O'Connor has spiritual concerns is an understatement. She continually emphasized the influence of her strongly held Catholic faith on her writing. As a Christian, she believed that spiritual forces underpin all of reality. She wrote that life is essentially mysterious and that a Christian artist should penetrate the concrete world in order to find at its depths the image of its source, the image of ultimate reality. And she found that this dance between realism and spirituality was actually not so strange in the Christ-haunted religious milieu of the American South. Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri immediately puts questions evoked by such a lofty approach to stories at the forefront. Good and evil, grief, justice, redemption, all are at play as we meet protagonist Mildred Hayes and hear of her search for justice after her teenage daughter has been brutally raped and murdered. She even speaks of such topics directly in an oddly sublime moment. Hey, baby. Yeah. Still no rest. How come, I wonder? Because there ain't no God and the whole world's empty and it doesn't matter what we do to each other? I hope not. In the midst of her suffering, she seems to view this chance encounter as a moment of contact with something beyond herself, a subtle collision of the earthly and divine that is all too common in O'Connor's stories. We can also see the fingerprints of Flannery O'Connor's cosmic vision in the film, centering its main conflict on an act of human evil. O'Connor saw a deliberate focus on evil in her stories as a response to an increasingly secularized world. She said of modern man that his sense of evil is diluted or lacking altogether. A critic put it this way, In her fiction, evil is not some generalized force or sociological trend or psychological tendency. Evil is concrete and tangible. Like Frankenstein's monster, evil in O'Connor's stories is clothed in flesh. The grotesque is a common term associated with Southern Gothic stories. Often authors create offbeat, off-putting characters to caricature some of the South's perceived flaws, such as its history of racism and religious fundamentalism. Flannery O'Connor does this at times, but her use of grotesque characters also taps deeply into her cosmic vision of reality. Think of characters like the misfit or the grandmother in her classic story A Good Man is Hard to Find. Critic Christina Bieber Lake wrote that O'Connor's grotesques shout out through their marginality, their inutility, their being extra, that there will always be something in excess of our philosophical systems, something we cannot accommodate or explain. O'Connor herself said that to recognize and understand such enigmatic characters, you have to have some conception of the whole man. And in the South, the general conception of man is still, in the main, theological. The film's three main characters, whose various arcs of development are the heart of the film, all in certain ways fit the bill of O'Connor's brand of grotesque. The divorcee Mildred Hayes is already an outsider in Ebbing, made even more so by her brash act of posting the billboards. Don't! Don't! You know who threw that can? What can? She's far from the model citizen or a model mother. She's foul-mouthed and crude, and she flouts the town's established authorities and hierarchies at every turn. So why don't you just finish up your tea there, father, and get the fuck out of my kitchen? However, we can see that she loves fiercely, 
Her personal turmoil and her family's brokenness reflect the destruction that human evil can wreak. When we meet Officer Jason Dixon, whose very name alludes to the Mason-Dixon line, we find him to be the epitomized caricature of a southern racist cop. Where the hell you keep that man on? He's a good man at heart. You tortured a guy in custody, Bill. He, like Mildred, is off-puttingly grotesque. Along with being racist, he is socially inept, and he is irrationally violent. What happened to your hand, Officer Dixon? Uh, just kinda banged it up a little bit while I was throwing some guy out a fucking window, you know, <laughs> usual. He is immature and obviously unsuited for a position of just authority in the town. And then there's the billboard's target, Chief Willoughby. While he's not necessarily grotesque in his morality or social conduct, he does reflect O'Connor's penchant for drawing attention to the fragility of the human body. Think of the young amputee Jane in her famous story, Good Country People. O'Connor often uses characters' disabilities or diseases to remind her readers that the physical and spiritual are intertwined and that all must face the mysteries of suffering and death. Willoughby's impending death from terminal cancer makes all this abundantly clear. All three of these characters do not fit the mold in various ways, yet in their ambiguity and grotesque states, they are all searching for something. They are primed, in the words of author Joyce Carol Oates, to be subjected to O'Connor's typical ritual of humbling, unmasking, and redemption. Most of Flannery O'Connor's stories deal with the very Christian themes of redemption and grace. However, she is famous for employing a very unique brand of grace. Grace that is unexpected. Grace that shocks and disarms her readers and her characters. Knowing she is writing for an increasingly secular audience, but still wanting to instill her Christian vision of reality in her stories, she wrote that her characters are often forced out to meet evil and grace and act on a trust beyond themselves, whether they know very clearly what it is they act upon or not. She also tended to integrate violence into her characters' experiences of grace. A critic wrote that Miss O'Connor used violence to convey her vision because she knew that the violence of rejection in the modern world demands an equal violence of redemption. Man needs to be struck by mercy. God must overpower him. In her own words, this notion that grace is healing omits the fact that before it heals, it cuts with the sword Christ said he came to bring. In this film, we can see this unique brand of grace at work in all three of these characters, starting with Chief Willoughby. His suicide, which is the turning point of the film, is jarring and violent to say the least. Whether or not we agree with his rationale or the morality of his choice, Willoughby himself insists that this act of violence was actually meant to spare his family the suffering of watching him die of cancer. He transcends the reality of his body's brokenness. We can view it as an act of grace, violent as it is towards his family. Now, I'm of course not saying that his suicide was the right thing to do. I'm only trying to analyze its function under the umbrella of Flannery O'Connor's unique approach to stories. Most importantly, it is Willoughby's suicide that paves the way for the unexpected redemption and unification of Mildred and Dixon, playing off the Christian pattern of sacrifice and resurrection. Willoughby becomes, through his letters, something of a godlike loving guide to Mildred and Dixon. In his letter to Mildred, he prophetically foreshadows how the potential murderer might be identified. And after her burning resentment and bitterness reaches a climax in the fire, she is able to start releasing her anger towards her husband and the police. Fire, this purging, purifying force, becomes what I think is the film's most potent symbol as we revisit the recently laid off Dixon. His experience of grace is most powerful of all as he listens to the voice of his surrogate father, urging him in love to better himself. We see another purging fire building behind him. Operatic music similar to the film's opening offers a heavenly quality. Dixon is forced to cast himself through the fire in which he, like Mildred, is purged in a scene of painful baptism. Like the fire Dante passes through as he enters paradise, and even like the fire at the end of O'Connor's novel, The Violent Bear It Away, it is ultimately a force of healing, destructive though it may be. As the fire is put out by James, someone previously on the receiving end of his hate, Dixon is reborn. I'm sorry, man. I don't care. Stop fucking crying, God. This all will just fuck up your wounds. I thought it was supposed to be good for your wounds. 
epitomizing O'Connor's violent grace, Dixon's healing comes with a painful cost. After these two cleansing fires, these characters, who are now refreshed by unexpected redemption, are brought together and set on the path of transcending the chains of who they once were. Now it's been said by many that Dixon is let off too easy, that he doesn't deserve the redemption he receives. I have to imagine O'Connor saying to this charge, yes, that's the point. None of us deserve grace, but we are all offered the oftentimes painful opportunity to be healed. One might also say that the film's redemption is incomplete, since the assumed killer is not caught, and Mildred and Dixon ride off to confront evil elsewhere. While the ending is ambiguous, like much of O'Connor's work, I still think that we can see her unique brand of grace at work. Mildred and Dixon are displaced from their previous states of mind by forces outside of their control. They head into the unknown and grasp onto new hope, new purpose, and new life. They realize more deeply that life is essentially mysterious, that there is something beyond themselves at work, and they desire to take part, somehow, in the renewal of this world. 